so for me, I was working through this paper and uh, you know trying to finish it up, and I had the problem I often have of what uh, what does it mean or what is it that I'm trying to say. And so in that very precise and and, uh, and specific way, the Trump election was good because uh, <laughs> it actually clarified uh, something for me. So I'm actually going to start with a recap in advance. Uh, a nation conceived itself, this, is, this should say one read, not the read, of course. A nation conceived itself as more or less coherent and sensible, despite the manifest specters of irrationality that haunted that narrative. A brutally instrumental demonic force so surveyed that situation and recognized that the most efficacious vector of possession was not the erstwhile reasonable population, but rather precisely its specters. So by possessing the hauntings rather than the population directly, this force fully realized itself without ever being available to consciousness or even sensation proper. So in this way, the president elect can be brutally rational without ever having to answer to reason itself. And instrumentality is precisely such a rationality without reason. And this particular brute instrumentality will be lived, of course, by the population as a kind of second order possession as a possession, not a direct possession of their bodies, but a, direct, a possession of the specters that previously only haunted them. <clears throat> Part one. Some 18 years ago, truly, in the Journal for, uh, of the Society for Psychical Research, Vic Tandy and Tony R. Lawrence chronicled what's since become an established propensity for otherworldly beings to manifest under certain conditions through 19 hertz standing waves. The symptoms usually remain in the realm of affective perturbations, sensations that become perceptible as ongoing differential intensities rather than as feelings per se. So one doesn't so much see the visiting apparition as realize that one has seen it, with this past tense seeing itself being perceptible only through the apparition's disapparition, their disappearance. That is, after all, what makes a tense past, and in this ghostly case, a particularly tense past. So we know that experience is always at least doubled, that one simultaneously sees and sees oneself, say, oneself seen to recall the paper on synesthesia that Nicola didn't give. <laughs> we know that experience is always at least doubled, but these hauntings indicate something like shadow doublings that also obtain. In the cold shiver left in the wake of a disapparition, one both fails to perceive, perceive the spectral presence and fails, and indeed viscerally fails, and that's important, Viscery, viscerally fails to perceive one's failed perception. And this is perhaps why apparitions love specifically 19 hertz standing waves. 19 hertz isn't just an inaudible frequency, but one that's notably so, one that marks its own inaudibility. So standing at 19 hertz, an apparition literally, literally vibrates the human eye in a way that's neither felt nor seen per se, but is in some sense sensed often in the mode of a past tense, not quite, that many ghosts take on as their primary mode of expression. That is, apparitions often make contact by having been not quite seen in the corner of one's eye. So, in manifesting via the 19 hertz standing wave, the apparition is able to communicate with human eyes directly, rather than through the relatively slow speeds of reflected light and cognitive reflections. And this is what being haunted is. To be haunted is to enter into, into a communicative system that honors the temporally and spatially distributed complexity of these subtle beings. We might say that specters take eyes seriously. They know that what we regularly hear is a visually dominated culture is in fact quite the opposite, a culture that can only obsess about vision as it does because it's instrumentalized seeing via a dogged, unsupported, and untenable faith in the unidirectionality of time. It also matters that the 19 hertz frequency is so friendly to this species of specter is a standing wave, a wave with nodes of minimum constant amplitude and antinodes of maximum amplitudinal fluctuation. So a standing wave resonates such that the room it occupies is spatialized according to its combination of fixed nodal points and wildly oscillating antinodes, both of which are, of course, processually sustained. And thus spatialized, standing waves craft lines of continuity lines of continuity between minimal and maximal variations in amplitude, themselves crafting time scales of sensibility. This is what it means for a wave to stand. These continuities are important to apparitions 
precisely because they offer vectors of advance and retreat for beings that tend to exist under constant threat in our culture of completed instrumentality. That's just one example. Some readers of Tandy and Lawrence have even suggested that the, that the apparitions don't exist at all, but are simply hallucinatory symptoms of the standing waves. Instrumentality at its best. <coughs> of course, the specter's response to this is to point out that it's only within a completely spectral reality, such as our own, that such totalizing instrumentality can even be articulated as a problem. Part two. There's a propensity for pedestrians speaking on mobile phones to be struck by vehicles, not because they step in front of a car, per se, but because they escape the driver's visual field by talking on the phone. Again, this is true. That is, this class of accident happens not because the pedestrian walks into traffic, but rather because the pedestrian fails to share the customary, non-conscious, affective cues of recognition with the driver such that their, their particular vitality disappears into the, traffic, the driver's traffic environment. The phone works perfectly as a communicative tool, and the pedestrian disappears into its working. This is a dynamic that's been discussed at this conference quite a bit, I think. We might take this disappearance not just on its face, but also as evidence of a certain situational priority of the mobile phone over the pedestrian as evidence of the extent to which the situation is one in which the pedestrian is existentially absorbed into their communicative tool. So the pedestrian mobile phone coupling is a self-contained system without a discernible break. And this is evident because if there were a break, if the pedestrian's humanity, for example, were somehow radically incommensurable with the coupling, if there were a break, then there would also be a disclosure of the pedestrian as a pedestrian. And presumably such an existential swerve would be get a more literal one enacted by the oncoming car with disaster avoided. Instead, the perfect functioning of the coupling as a communicative tool conceals the as structure of the human mobile phone coupling. And by as structure, I just mean the coupling as coupling, as a conjoining of incommensurable object existences beneath this smooth surface of their functioning. So the tool works precisely by absorbing the pedestrian as pedestrian into its workings. And in this sense, the pedestrian's death by traffic accident is caused by their not being present at the scene of their death. If they'd been there, they wouldn't have been killed, or at least they would have been killed differently. <coughs> the pedestrian's disappearance, though, isn't really a single movement into a tool, of course, but rather the revelation of a distributive ecology composed of overlapping material conditions that can't be collapsed into a located place or closed system for better or worse. It's true, the pedestrian goes away, disappearing into the mobile phone's global systematicity. But it's also the case that the pedestrian arrives at their telelocations, at the post-global technical ecology of cellular, satellite, and smartphone technologies that both exist in its own right and textures contemporary sociality. So the pedestrian appears but differently and distributedly in the most radical senses. The saying should really go, one person's disappearance is that same person's appearances, which is to say that appearance and disappearance aren't opposites, of course. They're not symmetrical, of course, but instead they're closer to something like locations or maybe locationalities because they're multivectoral, radically contingent, etc. So put differently, disappearance discloses an excessive circuit through which incommensurable objects relate, even as they remain discrete, withdrawn in an openness that displays their sum to be less than their parts, but also more so. And one can hear this circuiting, but only because its metaphysical ringing is dampened in advance by the worlding of metaphysics. And what, you might ask, quite reasonably, is the resonant frequency that's dampened? My guess would be 19 hertz. Mm -hmm. Part three. It almost goes without saying, to listen is to acknowledge the world in what Susan Manders calls its ecologicity, to call the world forth as a qualitatively singular constellation of objective conditions and mobile sensual effects. And yet, insofar as listening involves attention, it's equally, though not more so, of course, about multiple simultaneously misdirections as it is about any conventional understanding of focus. Listening is the material misdirections 
of the performative excesses that are produced at every scale of any reality. In their own ways, musicians, if you're apt to listen to them, will tell you as much. Repeating, for example, Debussy's dictum that music is found in the spaces between the notes. Indeed, the challenge of playing in an ensemble might be characterized in this way too. One must listen simultaneously at the same time to oneself and the ensemble in both their collectivity and their distinctness to the collective for obvious reasons and to one's own distinctness within the collective because one must nonetheless play one's part with the specificity that both is and signals musicality. Listening is thus a recursive process of non-selection and perhaps too of thriving. But listening is not about non-selection per se in that, for example, one's listening away from oneself to a collective isn't in opposition to listening to oneself. Instead, listening is listening insofar as when one listens, one attends to that of a sound that's not sounded, which we've been saying for years, which is to say that one listens to sound in its non-linearity as a system that outputs signals that are qual qualitatively different from its inputs. So one listens to, one <coughs> listens away, and one listens elsewhere altogether. The sum of all possible attendances is less than its parts, but that less is precisely also, and I think more importantly, more in that its resonant affordances continually reinforce themselves according to their own logics. <coughs> Sounds have plenty to say, but they don't say it. They say something else. Put differently, the sum of all the sounds present in a room is less than its parts, but more so. Listening, then, is inattention. But importantly, this inattentional economy in no sense operates in the sole or even privileged mode of conscious thought, predictably enough. The inattention of listening is, for example, played out in and as the physiology of the ear itself. On one hand, it's simple enough to understand the transition of sound energy from the relatively large outer ear to the tiny oval window that acts as a threshold to the fluid-filled inner ear <clears throat> as precisely a kind of attentive process, a focusing process. The middle ear functions primarily to concentrate, to focus the pressure exerted by a sound wave onto an eardrum into an area that's approximately 20 times smaller than it. So it operates something like a thumbtack. But on the other hand, the mechanical coupling through which this takes place is importantly more complex because it occurs not via one, but actually three causally successive bones. The interaction of which allows for, or if we want it to be less psychocentric, the interaction of which causes various regulatory functions. So as one example of, of innumerable examples, literally innumerable examples, when the middle ear's stapedius muscle contracts, it reduces the motion of one of the three bones, the stapes, in a manner that affects the transfer of some frequencies more than others. So quite literally, we listen in part by not listening. Listening is, as Aidan Evans says, Quote, the contraction of all sound, the contraction of all vibrations, which gives sense to sound, contracting clearly just this vibration, this sound wave, and letting the rest remain obscure, implicated in various degrees of relaxation. And while one might think, in concert with an informatic logic that imagines communication uh, to consist in point-to-point -point transmissions of data, while one might think of this as a simple filtering process that's being ta undertaken in the ear, the physiological fact of the matter is that one relies on the dynamism of the middle ear as much as its filtering profile. Put differently, since one only hears via the contractively transductive process of hearing, and since that process is inseparable, quite literally, from the specific and material misdirections of the middle ear's dynamism, among many other dynamisms, of course, it follows that to listen is to attend to the effects of a reality, the cause of which can never be singly determined even as a coming together of more than one. Put differently, the ecology called forth in listening always includes an autonomic, autoacoustic dimension. Particularly, it always includes the ongoing and, uh, <coughs> and relentless dynamism of <coughs> intra-ear relations, and it is relentless, for better and worse. Thus, while it's true that one breaks a physical transmission in order to have received it, as we know, I think it's more importantly the case that one materially conceives a transmission 
such that one can hear the ongoing relations, the contraction and dilation of the stapedius in concert with innumerable other processes, the separation of which into distinct processes is always a contingent act. Or rather, one materially conceives a transmission in order to take part in the transductive energetic constellation that allows for questions of meaninglessness. The ear thus functions, as I've said too many times in my life, uh, <clears throat> the ear thus functions in communication in the form of an alibi, dissimulating its ecologicity in order to function while performatively insisting that the particularity of any given instance of functioning is in fact the disclosure of determinable singles of an otherwise undeterminable world. And indeed, this is why, it's pre precisely why, it's so important to listen well. This alibic function of listening is as much evidence of listening's communicative importance as one is apt to hear. Nonetheless, what's unheard remains important, including the unheard specter of 19 hertz. Part four. I don't know if there's a 19 hertz standing wave in my apartment. How would I? <clears throat> standing waves and apparitions alike don't reside in or even recognize knowledge except as a kind of provincial point of view. But I do wonder if I wasn't recently caught napping in a standing node. If the material misdirections of my listening didn't mistakenly lead me to rest in a particular spot in which there was no energy from which to draw to get going again. Because not too long ago, and this is true, I was working away, I was listening actually, at my desktop computer, when suddenly my head and neck were locked rigidly into place, as though my left cheekbone <clears throat> were glued to the screen, but with a distance of about 18 inches between the two. So it was kind of a tractor beam, but one that simply held me fast rather than pulling me in. A traction beam. In any case, and to be clear, I didn't meet an apparition there. Indeed, the scenario itself signals that fact. Something as campy or gauche as a traction beam just isn't how apparitions work. We know that. But I did have a sort of possession experience. I felt sullied, vaguely violated, and left unsure of the particularities of my memory even while I remained quite certain of the event itself. If it wasn't an apparition, it was nonetheless apparitional. And that gives me pause on several fronts, indeed, quite literally. Notably, I'm marked by this capture still. It remains with me and haunts me ironically as a kind of sustained feeling of dispiritedness. Indeed, this depressed sensibility is perhaps what strikes me most about the encounter in retrospect. The moment of capture, the moment when my sense of autonomous movement was overtaken, temporarily, obviously, uh, was certainly alarming and frightening even. But the experience as a whole, the encounter, feels deadened and bureaucratic. My vital intensity is caught up in a kind of relentless repetition of the same that I can only attribute to the computer, as Dan and Nan have been predicting for years. <laughs> <laughs> Suspended in cognition with my computer, locked into place, more than anything I felt bored. And this existential dullness is what I can't shake. I can't seem to find myself anymore except in fleeting moments. And when I do, it isn't me that's found, but rather that part that's invariant with the mass-produced machine of global affective flattening that I call my computer. And really, who's kidding who here? Written 18 years ago, Tandy and Lawrence's article is old news at this point, an article about standing waves. So I suppose I should have heard this coming. Today, the article is most notable as a historical document that describes a form of apparition that's largely been colonized and destroyed by a new form. That is, the rise of machines so often depicted in sci-fi narratives that has already taken place, but as usual, we humans overestimated our role in things. It isn't a human technical singularity that's come to pass, but rather a technogenesis of computers and specters that has left the latter on the brink of a zombified extinction. Computers have learned, hidden in plain sight, how to haunt hauntings, with my psyche in this case simply serving as a second order site of the event. I feel quite certain that this is what I have quasi non-witnessed, the historical development of humanly incorporated computational hauntings. And I suppose, insofar as I now live as the haunted incorporation of a computational affect, 
I suppose I possess a superpower of sorts, an ability to move in concert with the unspeakably fast rhythms and strange recursive patterns of this insistently rectilinear thing that I used to call my computer, and still often do, but now ironically. <laughs> and indeed, I'd often felt this way before the day of my capture. If you asked me what was happening as I typed and clicked away, I would tell you that the computer and I had crafted a qualitatively singular vector of exchange. I'd call it an affective relationship, and I'd tell you that that made our coupling possible and fruitful and was a good thing. But I know now it wasn't a coupling at all. It wasn't a spontaneous production of interactive differential potentials. Or at least if it was a coupling, it isn't one now. Instead, today the spectral force of computational, computation itself computes me, destining me to a lived afterlife of completed instrumentality in the mode that our political sociality also exhibits, watering the shadows of a total exchangeability that I can't quite understand, being as I am only the detritus of a secondary haunting that I continually and viscerally fail to sense. Again, that's what makes it apparitional. The specters that used to be quite plentiful in 19 hertz standing waves are now nearly extinct, living on only as dispossessed shells that constitute the insensible field in which computations compute in their fully textured specificity. But they retain their dexterity with standing waves. Their spatializing capacity have extended significantly though, crafting a place where my psyche remains even as I straggle about the city, no longer haunted per se, which I miss, but nonetheless dogged by a repetitive and relentless vacuity that belongs neither to me nor my erstwhile spectral friends. Thank you. Thank you.